Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome or welcome back to Food and Nutrition Day at the Melbourne Festival of Ideas here at the University of Melbourne. And what an appropriate uh, start to the afternoon's session. A man in a suit speaking at the front and everyone in the audience just talking amongst themselves while that goes on. It's like I'm back at uni again. Uh, my name is uh, Julian Morrow. Uh, I'm, uh, it's a very great pleasure to be here uh, as part of the Festival of Ideas. Uh, I'm from The Chaser, but I'm also from the ABC, of course, so I have an obligation to be editorially balanced. So I also need to say it's also not a great pleasure to be here, just to <laughs> make that clear. Um, and uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone involved in the organisation of, of this event, and in particular the new Attorney General George Brandis for letting me use his com car today. It's been, uh, it's made things <laughs> a lot easier. Um, I'm very happy to be associated uh, with this event as part of my ongoing project to undermine the intellectual standards and respectability of valued Australian institutions. Um, I don't know why uh, I, of all people, have been asked to pay respects, but I will do it uh, at the beginning. Uh, I would, of course, like, as I'm sure we all would, to acknowledge uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional custodians of this land uh, that we are gathered on, and we pay their respects to their elders, past and present, unless they're related to Chris Kenny. Um, I'd also... Uh, encourage you uh, to be part of the um, uh, Bunjil's Nest program, which is uh, downstairs. Everyone can contribute to that, and it's a fantastic project. Uh, there's information about it in the uh, festival materials, and we do want everyone to, to be a part of it. It's, um, it's, a, it's a great tradition. This session, of course, is entitled, Are We Manufacturing uh, Allergies? And it brings together an impressive collection of highly respected, thoughtful, intelligent women with expertise in the area and me. Uh, uh, although I suppose I do have some experience in uh, triggering undesired and unpleasant responses, so perhaps that's my... Uh, I think if, the, if this session was a list of ingredients, I would be the may contain traces of nut bit at the end. <laughs> Uh, the purpose of this session is to uh, interrogate the myths and realities uh, of the 21st century, quote, allergy epidemic. According to respected publications like the press release for this session, one in five Australians are currently affected by an allergic disease. Uh, and numbers also suggest that this could rise to one in four, which is a 70% increase by 2050, which is a 37% increase in the years of this century. What is an allergy? This is one of the questions we will be addressing today. What's an allergic disease? Uh, why is it increasing so rapidly? How do food allergies affect quality of life? What are the myths of, around food allergies? What time does the bar open? How do we manage to life-threatening uh, food allergies in the school setting? Is Tony Abbott really the Prime Minister of Australia? Can we... <laughs> trust food allergy labels? What would the science minister say if there was one? When are, we going, when are we going to hear from someone who actually knows what they're talking about? These are some of the questions that we'll be contemplating in the next 90 minutes. The answer to at least the last of them is very soon. Just after I remind you uh, that if you would prefer to use social media rather than actually listening during this session, uh, the hashtag to record that with is uh, you, hashtag UOM. F -O -I. I'm amazed that that was available. U-O-M-F-O-I. Uh, um, please, though, uh, we are uh, using social media as, as a genuine resource for the discussion that the Festival of Ideas uh, entails. So we are looking for critical insights about what's being discussed and direct questions for the speakers. We will have an, op uh, an open-ended Q&A session after the initial addresses, and we'll be sourcing some of those from the Twitter feed, so please do participate on that front. Uh, now to our first speaker. Each of our speakers to begin the session has uh, 10 minutes to speak, uh, and our first speaker is Susan Prescott, the Winthrop Professor at the University of Western Australia, where she's a practicing paediatrician who specializes in treating children with asthma and allergic diseases. Susan's also the director of the World Allergy Organization, or WOW, as I like to call it. Uh, her research is internationally recognised. She's the author of The Allergy Epidemic and The Calling, in addition to more than 200 scientific publications. Please make her welcome. Thank you very much indeed. It's a, it's a wonderful um, opportunity to be here. My role today is to really set the scene by putting allergy in the broader context. The allergy epidemic is really a clear indicator that our immune systems are specifically vulnerable to modern environmental changes. We can think of allergy very much as a canary in the coal mine because this has major implications for other aspects of our health. 
Allergy is an integral part of this pandemic of non-communicable diseases or NCDs. These are the chronic diseases that are affecting virtually all organ systems, ranging from heart disease, obesity, diabetes, right through to mental ill health and of course asthma and allergies are part of this. All of these conditions are dramatically increasing in modern societies. The United Nations have recently recognised NCDs as a major global threat to human development. These are now the biggest killers worldwide. Allergies are in fact one of the most common NCDs. They affect 30 to 40 per cent of the population at some stage of life. There's hundreds of millions globally affected by allergies. And of greatest relevance to our discussion today, these are the earliest onset NCDs, beginning within weeks or months of birth. So this again highlights that early vulnerability of the immune system to our modern environment. And yet allergic diseases are generally neglected on the global NCD political agenda. But they're very important, very irrelevant as an early barometer of the environmental impact on our health. This pandemic of NCDs is inexorably linked to modern environmental changes. These modern changes are clearly complex, but when we look at the many NCDs, including allergies, they share the same sorts of risk factors. And these shared risk factors are also our targets for trying to prevent disease. And the sorts of risk factors I'm talking about range from cleaner environments, unhealthy nutrition, stress, isolation, pollution, physical inactivity, smoking alcohol, and reduced natural light. So common risk factors will mean common solutions. So I'm really trying to stress at the outset that we need to take a more integrated, unified approach to both health and disease, to risk factors and solutions. And the immune system, which is here what we're talking about, is actually perfect as a potential unifying theme. Because if we can promote immune health, we will have benefits for many systems. So with that in mind, what is allergy? Well, it's basically an inappropriate immune response to the environment, which leads to inflammation. And inflammation takes many forms. In young children, the most common forms are food allergy and eczema. In Australia now, one in four infants has eczema and one in 10 infants has food allergy. As children get older, they're more prone to respiratory allergies and by school age, about one in four children have asthma. We're seeing an increasing burden of all of these allergic diseases over the last 50 years or so, but particularly recent, re recently we've seen an increase in the burden of food allergies and eczema. And this, again, is striking in the preschool children. We've also seen a striking increase in the numbers of children presenting to our emergency departments with the very severe form of allergy, the anaphylactic reaction. Again, you can see the top line there that this is actually most common in the preschool children. And if you're not already convinced, you just need to take a bigger look at the wider issue of immune disease, that not just allergies are increasing, but so are the broad range of immune diseases, the autoimmune diseases, ranging from type 1 diabetes, MS, inflammatory bowel disease, thyroid disease, all of these conditions. All stress that our modern environments are affecting our immune system and making us much more prone to inflammation. And if we look more broadly at all of those NCDs, inflammation is a common element to all of them. Heart disease is inflammatory, obesity is inflammatory, diabetes, and so on. And this highlights a very central role of the immune system in all of these conditions. We also know that a substantial component of the risk of all of these NCDs, including allergies, is programmed very early in life. That exposures, including our nutritional patterns, microbe exposures, stress, pollution, all influence developing organ systems and functions in ways that influence our future disease risks, both early and later onset NCDs, even those that may not appear for many decades. And this is clearly true in the case of the immune system. Children who develop allergies already show differences in their immune function at birth. We've also shown that there are a number of environmental exposures in pregnancy which influence immune function in the developing fetus and the newborn. So again, stressing the importance of early development. 
And because the immune system reaches into virtually every organ system, it may influence the tissue and, and uh, organ development of those organs. So anything that influences immune development has the potential to influence many other systems. We are all prone to low-grade inflammation in modern societies, and there is growing evidence that this propensity for low-grade inflammation is also programmed in early life. And low-grade inflammation is a major risk factor, not just for allergies, but for many of these chronic diseases, uh, and including all-cause mortality. The lifestyle factors, which I've already mentioned, many of these have direct effect direct effects on the immune system. Even exercise has effects on our immune function. So does stress, so does pollution, and so do many of these nutritional factors. So if we can use these pathways to promote immune health, to promote metabolic health, we'll stand a much better chance of preventing not just allergy, but a wider range of inflammatory diseases. So in summary, humans have clearly been been affecting the health of our planet. And in this very unhealthy relationship, it's no wonder that this is beginning to affect our own health. We are facing an increasingly crowded world, and this is going to be placing an unsustainable burden on our food, on our water, on our energy supplies. And all of this has huge implications for human health into the future. <coughs> it's very important that we keep human health and the environmental health at the core of these major global challenges. And as we look for solutions to the allergy epidemic, to the wider NCD epidemic, it's very important that we shift responsibility towards governments, towards policy, and away from blaming individuals. As individuals, we might think that we have a choice over what we eat, our physical activity, our social behaviour, our stress and how we cope with it. But a lot of our opportunities, a lot of our choices are actually dictated by the quality of our natural environment, by the quality of our built environment and by our food, air and water quality. Our choices are also dictated by our cultural systems, our social structures and our collective behaviours. Now, clearly, we are facing some very big problems, and I'm trying to encourage us to take a very big picture, to look at um, this in a much more unified way, to see the interconnections, because if we don't do that, it's going to be much harder for us to make the big changes that are needed. So, in conclusion, and thinking big, I believe we all want mental, physical and spiritual well-being of individuals and of societies. And it's clear that this can only be achieved through cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral collaboration. But our greatest challenge is to overcome the effects of urbanisation as the major culprit in not just the allergy epidemic, but in this whole pandemic of NCDs. And when, when we look at it this way, it's very clear that we need to address the complex social, cultural and economic determinants of health. So time is clearly of the essence. There are not going to be any quick solutions, but on the other hand, we can't afford to wait. Prevention must begin in early life, but for all of us here, it's still never too late. We are at a crossroads, but I believe we still have the opportunity to choose a brighter future. Thank you very much. I do just want to mention the co-op bookshop has asked me to indicate that uh, the book, The Allergy Epidemic, if you want to read in more depth about all of this, is on sale in the main foyer. If you're interested in reading more about the global health issues, then look out for the Origins book, which is coming out next year. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Susan. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Katie Allen. 
Uh, Katie is a uh, pedi pediatric gastroenterologist and allergist undertaking research in the evolving field of food allergy. Uh, she was the, she's the principal investigator on the Health Nut study at the uh, Murdoch Children's Research Institute, which is the largest population-based study of food allergy in children ever. Uh, in June last year, she was made a fellow of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, the quadruple AI. Uh, very impressive. Uh, the uh, um, uh, find an expert says, to our knowledge, the first gastroenterologist to be awarded that honour. Great to see that gastroenterologists have stopped being so cruelly back black banned by that organisation. Uh, she's also published some fantastic um, and highly regarded articles, which of course I haven't read, uh, but I have read the titles, uh, and I do love them. Uh, uh, get a read of, uh, if, you, if you're a subscriber, and I'm sure you are, to the Australian uh, Family Physician, uh, Gastroesophageal Reflux in Children, What's the Worry? That's a great one. Uh, uh, I was brushing through the Clinical and Experimental Allergy Journal recently, and uh, the essay titled, Frequently Baked Egg, in uh, Frequent Baked Egg in Ingestion Was Not Associated with Change in a Rate of Decline in Egg Skin Prick Test in Children with Challenge Confirmed Egg Allergy, had me not wanting to read more, because I felt like I got the conclusion already. Uh, <laughs> And do yourself a favour and don't miss out on uh, fetal progenitor cell transplantation treats uh, methyl malonic aciduria in a mouse model. It's, um, it's a real page turner. Please welcome Professor Katie Allen. Do you know I've had a lot of introductions in my life, but that is the best one I've ever had. Do you know what? I can't believe, Julian, you did not read my book, which was Kids Food Allergy for Dummies. <laughs> now, following on from the, the illustrious Susan Prescott, I'm actually going to take you down the road of are we eating what we think we are eating? Why is that important, you might ask me? Well, it's important because we all have to eat. I know that's obvious, but we all also have to care for the people in our community who cannot eat certain foods. So I'm going to talk to you today about what we should be doing about something called precautionary labelling. So you may not have thought about precautionary labelling, it's a formal academic term, but I'm sure you've all heard about may contain nuts. We've already had a joke from Julian about he stole my thunder on that. But may contain traces, you might say, who really cares? And I say, you need to care because what we do with regards to these sorts of legislations, regulations, has an effect on things like the price and accessibility of food. So therefore, it affects all of us here in Melbourne, in this lecture theatre, but for everybody around the world. As individuals in a community, we take risks all the time, crossing the road, driving to work, riding a bike. But as a community, we have a responsibility to ensure that there's an acceptable and tolerable level of risk to protect our members. That is why we have laws and regulations. Uh, risks such as should we immunise our children? The benefits are obvious, but there are obviously some people in the community who also worry about the risks. So we really need to think about, at the community level, what are the risks and benefits of what we do in a public health way? The assessments of risk by our regulators also incorporates the safety of things like our water and the food we eat. We all need safe and accessible food and water and we all need to eat and drink. But there is a risk to even drinking something like tap water. How many of you know that about 1 in 20 million people will die from drinking tap water? You might say, well, that sounds a bit ridiculous, but it is actually a defined risk. We know that some water is contaminated with Giardia, which is a gastrointestinal infection. Some people get sick from that. Unfortunately, about 1 in 20 million people each year die from drinking tap water. That translates to about a 1 in 300,000 lifetime risk for each individual in the general community. So all of us are at risk of dying from drinking tap water. So the issue of what's acceptable and tolerable to the community is a really important question I would, I would actually ask you to all think about. And it also has an impact with regards to some members of our community have more risks than others. So with regards to children and adults who have food allergy, there are some foods that they cannot risk eating safely. Uh, 
And so we really need to think about the impact of that risk. How likely is there to be a risk about eating a certain food? And what is the harm that may result? So is the harm likely to be a mild uh, annoyance, a little bit of a swelling of the face or a little bit of a hive or some vomiting? Personally, I wouldn't like to have that every time I ate a food if there was that risk. Um, maybe we would accept that. But would we accept someone dying from anaphylaxis, which is the most severe end of the spectrum from having a food allergy reaction? What would be the cost of trying to make sure that we can guarantee that everybody can eat every food all the time? If you ask that question of, of water, for instance, how could we ensure that everybody can drink sterile water and there would never be a death? Imagine the cost to the community of ensuring an absolutely secure water, water supply. So these things are important for our community to think about. I contend that we should consider banning the use of precautionary labelling, the use of may contain traces by food manufacturers. This is because precautionary labelling is ubiquitous, it's ambiguous, and it may be putting the lives of children with food allergy and adults with food allergy at risk. I also contend that the cost of improving precautionary labelling in its current form is, out likely, to, uh, is likely to outweigh the benefits. So what is precautionary labelling and why? Why is it used and why is it appearing to be everywhere? There are two types of labelling of food. There's one called mandatory labelling, um, and the allergy world has been very proactive in ensuring the safety of children and adults with food allergy by ensuring that foods that contain the common food allergens, which are peanuts, tree nuts, cow's milk, egg, wheat, soy, seafood, um, if they've been added to a flu food, a manufacturer needs to declare that in easily understandable, easily readable language. And that's working. But there's a second form of labelling that the manufacturing industry has decided to implement for itself. It's unregulated and it's voluntary. And that's called precautionary labelling. And it's the may contain has been processed on, made on similar equipment type of statements that are on food labels currently. There's nobody in the world except for Japan and Switzerland that currently legislates about precautionary labelling. But it's really aiming to convey a possible risk that, um, uh, that there may be shared facilities or there may be commingling of food allergens. The problem with the precautionary labelling is that it warns allergic consumers about what they can't eat. It actually, there is no form of labelling that tells them what they can eat. So there is no provision for saying, but this food is okay. So it's all about precautionary, it's all about warning. So effectively, currently, the manufacturers are passing the buck and leaving it to the allergic consumers and their caring physicians to help make decisions about risks that their children um, and families will be taking. So the next question is, well, how ubiquitous is uh, precautionary labelling? So we've done a couple of supermarket surveys, which is great fun for new PhD students, sending them off to a supermarket survey, slave labour, you may say, but no, it's very important research. And we've looked at how often precautionary labelling is used. And we found that more than 65% of all edible packaged goods now has some form of scary warning label that says, be careful, don't eat this food. And as you can see up here, when you look at those snack products um, in particular, they're really very ubiquitous. So there's a very high prevalence of the use of precautionary labelling. How useful is precautionary labelling to the allergic consumer? Well, it's confusing. As I said before, there's no identification of what foods are actually safe to eat. It's often ignored, unfortunately, um, and perhaps by the wrong people, and I'll give you some evidence about that. And unfortunately, we also don't know how safe it is to ignore it at this point in time. So the biggest issue for, for children and families with food allergy is that we cannot say which um, exposure to which um, to a level of food will re result in a minor reaction or a more severe, serious reaction. We're desperately trying to work it out. But at the moment, we can't say whether one reaction will be severe or another reaction will be minor. All we, all we can say is those who've had a history of anaphylaxis are more likely to have a subsequent history, uh, a subsequent event of anaphylaxis. But of those who have anaphylaxis, about 80% have only had a mild reaction previously. So unfortunately, we don't have any good predictors for those who are going to have a more severe reaction versus a less severe reaction. What is the cost of this precautionary um, labelling to the community? And really, why should we care? Well, I'm going to put up a slide to tell you why we should care. 
If you look at schools now, there seems to be a difference of opinions about what we should be doing with regards to food banning in, in the school situation. And there is a lot of uh, variation on this, but one school in Sydney um, has decided to ban a whole variety of foods in lunchboxes. It raises for me the first question, well, who's going to be checking these lunchboxes? So you can imagine lunchbox Nazis going and checking little Johnny's lunchbox on a daily basis. It's almost un un uncheckable from my, my opinion. Um, but you can see a whole list of different foods, and unfortunately he's gone off the bottom. But the other thing that they had at the bottom of this letter was any products that may contain traces of nuts or tree nuts. And as I just said to you before, that's 65% of all edible packaged goods. What does the school eat? They could grow themselves in the backyard, but at, at the end of the day, they're saying that paper, people can't eat these sorts of foods um, in their lunchboxes. So well, then the question is, well, and, and by the way, what we say is that food banning is not necessarily the way to go. You should basically s prevent children from sharing food because that's something that can be rolled out to all children in the school classroom. You don't have to then monitor who has bought food and who hasn't bought food. But then the question is, well, how unsafe are consumer behaviours with regards to ignoring or avoiding precautionary labelling? We've undertaken a super, uh, sorry, another survey and looked to see whether those who have a risk of anaphylaxis are uh, um, acting differently from those who don't have a risk of anaphylaxis. Unfortunately, this is meant to say ignore. But what you can see here is a whole plethora of different types of precautionary labelling statements that are on, currently on food from same factory to maybe present. And if you look at those who have a history of anaphylaxis those versus those who have a mild to moderate reaction, there's no difference. So people are not using a risk stratification method in order to decide how they feed their children. So well, what is the report card for the manufacturing industry? Um, what does it mean from the point of view of are they actually avoiding and um, keeping allergens out of their food? We looked again in Australia and we found that luckily we're very good um, at keeping um, contamination out of the food chain supply. So looking at the Australian figures, we've got a fairly low rate of contamination with peanut compared to other countries. And when you look at the other foods in the Australian food chain supply, we, we seem to have an even lower rate of, of contamination. So we're not doing too badly. But the question is, why the precautionary labelling there if it's actually not necessarily reflecting true contamination? How is industry responding to the growing concerns about consumer complacency towards labelling? Well, 10 minutes. Oh, I better finish up then. So sorry. So in conclusion, I think the most important thing to realise is that precautionary labelling only informs patients about what to avoid. Permissing labelling, however, is urgently required to inform a patient about what food they can eat. No manufacturer is currently indicating which food has been through a risk assessment tool. So in conclusion, precautionary labelling is prevalent, it's ambiguous and it's often ignored. Policies that promote the more effective use of risk assessment tools and precautionary statements are urgently required. Alternatively, I think we should consider banning precautionary labelling as has been done in Japan and Switzerland. Are we, eating, are, are we eating what we think we are eating? Well, I believe we just don't know. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Katie. And I, I should apologise. It is true that I, I, I haven't read your, your book for dummies. Um, I, I read the Brodie's notes on it, the kind of summary of it. <clears throat> And uh, I found it excellent. Um, <clears throat> there is water for all the speakers uh, during their speeches, but after that talk, I for one will not be touching it, I can guarantee you. <clears throat> uh, my favourite packaging claim that I've ever seen is a packet of nuts that says, may contain traces of nuts. So <laughs> it does get over-labelled. Uh, our next speaker is Professor uh, Connie Catalaris. Uh, she's Professor of Immunology and Allergy at the University of Western Sydney. Uh, her first romantic novel, A Young Woman with Autoimmune Progesterone Dermatitis, was published in Medicine Today in 2012 and has been optioned by Steven Spielberg. Uh, <clears throat> please make her welcome to the stage. One in 10 of our young children has a food allergy. This is a phenomenon that has developed over the last 15 to 20 years. 
While any food can cause an allergy, just a few foods account for over 90% of food allergy in our paediatric population. And these include egg, milk, peanut, wheat and soy, followed closely by tree nuts and some seafood. The majority of affected children will eventually grow out of these allergies and become tolerant, but it does depend somewhat upon the food that they're allergic to, with peanut, tree nut and some seafoods least likely to be outgrown. While we have tests to demonstrate sensitisation to a food, no test at yet, as yet is 100% reliable at demonstrating this growth of tolerance. Most commonly, allergic reactions cause acute skin rashes such as hives and swelling. But they can also occur, uh, cause abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, severe breathing difficulties and collapse. And when there are a number of these signs and symptoms, we use the term anaphylaxis, a sudden onset life-threatening event. Thus, a diagnosis of food allergy carries with it the potential for a life-threatening event to occur if that food is accidentally ingested. Our management of this at present is to counsel parents and children about how to avoid the offending food and to give them the ability to promptly treat in the event of an acute allergic reaction should an accidental ingestion occur. And we do this by equipping them with a device to self-administer adrenaline the only medication that will work promptly enough in such a situation. So today, for a few minutes, I want to leave the global big picture and I want you to focus on the more personal. I want to bring your attention down to that parent and that family that copes with this scenario. And I want to highlight three aspects of management of those with a food allergy diagnosis that I believe need more attention from the wider community. To live with the fear of having a reaction to a common food places great stress on parents and on the family as a whole, and it frequently changes the way they live and socialise. The strain of coping with your child with a food allergy is considerable. Knowing that your normal healthy child may be at risk of this life-threatening event if the wrong food is ingested, weighs heavily on many parents and causes a great deal of stress and anxiety. This is compounded when there is lack of understanding of the importance of such an allergy, and even worse, when a parent's statement of the food allergy is treated with contempt. Some parents and families are remarkably resilient and they find coping mechanisms that are healthy and enhance the parent-child relationship. For others, unfortunately, the stress and anxiety are too much, and we witness abnormal coping mechanisms and the inevitable transfer of undue levels of anxiety to the child. This can be manifested by total avoidance of social situations, so that the child becomes anxious and withdrawn and carries that behaviour into the teens and the twenties. We have come a long way in implementing strategies to keep children safe in childcare and school facilities. But there is still a general level of ignorance within the wider community of what having a food allergy really means. Unfortunately, some of that difficulty can be with other family members who perceive that a mother is being overprotective or even neurotic about her young child and statements such as a little bit of the food won't hurt are often made. This is a view that's sometimes expressed by well-meaning grandparents who grew up in an era never hearing of allergies, let alone never meeting somebody with a food allergy. So this adds to the burden and the feeling of isolation that many parents feel. We've seen cases of bullying at school where a child with peanut allergy is chased around the playground with a peanut butter sandwich, the bully thinking that it's a great joke to see the poor victim terrified. So the first thing we can do 
is to grow community understanding through more education. In all surveys, the greatest source of stress for families managing food allergies is difficulty understanding labels on foodstuffs. And you've just heard an excellent uh, dissertation on that, that topic. Yes, there have been real advances and improvements in food labelling for food allergens in Australia, but there is still much to be done to assist those living with food allergy. And again, to personalise it, I want to illustrate some of the problems faced by people with just two examples. A friend of mine works in a popular bar in Sydney, and this place has a bar menu with some gluten-free GF options on it. A young woman approached my friend with her order and was very persistent in checking and double-checking that indeed her choice was gluten-free. Given her level of persistence, my friend decided just to duck out the back and to double-check with the cook. He looked at the item and he said, oh, there's a tiny bit of flour on it, but yeah, it's gluten-free. <laughs> I recently saw a young Asian mum with limited English. I confirmed that her son had a cow's milk allergy and somewhat unusually a coconut allergy. We had a long discussion, quite difficult with the language barrier, about keeping him safe and checking food ingredients and food labels. She rang just one week later, stating that she had nearly killed him. They were out shopping in an Asian grocery store when he said he was thirsty. So she bought him a drink labelled as soy milk, knowing that he drinks soy milk all the time at home. After one mouthful, this little boy told her he felt very sick, and soon after he collapsed. Thankfully, the shop assistant called an ambulance that came promptly. The ambulance officers administered adrenaline and oxygen and stabilised him before taking him to hospital. <coughs> Mum told the officer of her son's allergies, so he checked the drink carefully and found that on the back it contained cow's milk and coconut milk. No amount of talking on my part that day could console that mother as she kept picturing what might have been. Yes, labelling has improved, but there is still a need for more truth in labelling. My third and final point concerns timely health services delivery. A responsive healthcare system should be able to adapt to changing patterns in disease so that appropriate services may be diverted to where they are needed. At the present time, food challenge is the only way to confirm that tolerance to a food has developed. This procedure, by necessity, carries the risk of inducing an allergic reaction, so it certainly needs careful supervision. The general public is aware of published waiting times for surgery and waiting times in emergency departments, but there is no such published, published list for waiting times for medical outpatient services, nor for medical procedures such as food challenges. And I can tell you that in a large city north of here, the average time for an in-hospital food challenge to be performed is about 12 months. This is a major issue for all of us caring for children with food allergies and for their parents. We need, simply, more resources. Space, trained personnel and time slots for challenges to be done. Once we can safely show that a child can tolerate a food, there is a dramatic change in the whole family. There is no longer a need to study every label during grocery shopping. The child can have any food from any outlet. Parties become pleasurable. Takeaway and restaurant meals become feasible rather than a source of great apprehension. And this changes the whole dynamic and quality of life within a family. I want to read from a very precious letter written to me by one of my patients. He says, and I quote, Thank you for looking after me so well. It wasn't as scary as I thought, referring to a food challenge, and now I can eat anything. I don't have to worry that my mum is worrying about me. No offence, Dr K, but I hope I never need to see you again <laughs> and that I never need skin tests and blood tests. Thanks for looking after me. Yes, we need more funding for research to find a cure. 
We need to learn how to prevent allergies in the first place. But in the meantime, those living with food allergies need our help now. Parents whose responsibility it is to look after these children need encouragement, not criticism. They need timely access to specialist clinics and, if appropriate, timely access to food challenges in a safe environment. I don't want to read of another child's death from food-induced anaphylaxis. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Connie. Uh, our final speaker before we move to the uh, general discussion is Gina McColl, who's a uh, senior journalist at The Age. Gina has written extensively uh, and is uh, deeply concerned with allergies, which is uh, a change for um, most Fairfax journalists because they're generally concerned with just being made redundant. So it's nice that uh, she's got something else to distract her from that. Uh, please welcome to the stage Gina McColl. Living with the risks. Um, that's right, I'm a journalist at The Age with a particular interest in public policy and social trends. So why am I talking on a panel of highly credentialed experts about food allergies when I'm not even a specialist health reporter? What expertise could I possibly have? I'm here to talk about killer peanuts and birthday cake bans, about school lunchboxes harbouring dangerous allergens that are tantamount to our kids playing Russian roulette, about kids needing written permission before being allowed to buy food from the school fete, I'm here to talk about something the media knows best, how to beat up a story, hype up fear, ramp up anxiety, and sell stuff in the process. Killer peanuts, Russian roulette, these are actual examples taken from Australian media coverage of food allergies and the extreme reaction known as anaphylaxis. Anything that mixes children, everyday items, and the risk of death is a sensational mix. Justifiably so, it's a terrible threat. Indeed, as the parent of a child diagnosed at risk of anaphylaxis due to food allergies, these are real and present dangers for me. I've been known to get into arguments with security guards and ushers because I have to keep my mobile in my bag or her EpiPen with me at all times because I have a child at risk of anaphylaxis. But exactly how big is that risk? How many people, not kids, people of any age, die from food-induced anaphylaxis each year? 10 deaths? Five? Reliable studies of anaphylaxis deaths from any cause are limited worldwide, but a study of such deaths and hospital admissions in Australia, published in a top medical journal in 2009, found that fewer than one death a year was due to food. Nor were deaths from food-induced anaphylaxis found to be rising. Deaths from anaphylaxis were overwhelmingly due to drugs, especially antibiotics and anaesthetics. Insect stings caused three times more deaths than food. Figures in the United States are broadly similar. A recent report in the Huffington Post said 11 people died from food-related anaphylaxis in 2005, among a population more than 13 times Australia's. Quote, more people died from lawnmower accidents, the report concluded. So deaths from food allergies are incredibly rare. Compare this to, say, asthma, which the National Asthma Society says caused 378 deaths in Australia in 2011. Why then, might we ask, as taxpayers and consumers, is there this huge focus on the dangers of food allergies? If you believe in evidence-based medicine and health policy, there are reasonable questions to be asked about whether food allergy risks have become panic-driven, whether fears of those risks have become an ep epidemic of their own. In an article published in The Age in April, I looked at some of the exaggerated claims made by the main support and lobby group for allergy sufferers and traced the connection between that support group with drug and food manufacturers and retailers with business interests in the allergy market and with some specialist doctors and peak health bodies. Food allergies may be increasing, although some believe it is in the diagnosis of them that is increasing rather than the actual rates themselves, but the fact is most allergies are managed by things like avoiding triggers and using antihistamines. And having allergies, even severe allergies, is not a predictor of being at risk of dying from anaphylaxis. Who is at risk? The reaction is unpredictable, but the guidelines are those who have experienced anaphylaxis before or those who have had a systemic reaction to an allergy test, not just a local reaction, and as well as that, have factors like poorly controlled asthma, a nut allergy, are in their teens or 20s, or are in remote areas where it might take a while to get medical attention. 
Having a blood test or a huge reaction to a skin test is no indication of being at risk. I also investigated gaps in the public health practices around food allergies, including the likely overprescription of EpiPens, the handy little devices that allow non-medical people to inject adrenaline if an anaphylactic reaction does occur, like that famous scene in Pulp Fiction, but in the thigh rather than the chest. Doctors admitted to me that sometimes EpiPens were prescribed for people who have allergies, but no real reason to think they are at risk of anaphylaxis. Yet many doctors ignore the guidelines, writing scripts for people who have had a skin prick or blood test only. Why? Some doctors admit EpiPen prescriptions are sometimes, done to, sometimes given to alleviate anxiety rather than potential risks. EpiPens are really expensive, costing about $106 each, and are listed on the PBS. Most people are prescribed two, and they only last about 12 months. The cost last year would have been around $17 million. This doesn't seem like great evidence-based use of public funds, and the potential harms go beyond the economic. There was a report in the Herald Sun this month about a secondary school in Oakley sending kids home because some buildings had been pelted with eggs and flour, even though the year 12s were preparing for exams. The deputy head was quoted as saying, we have a significant number of anaphylactic children in our school and it was for their protection. Really? In case what? The egg and flour flicked off a wall and ricocheted into someone's mouth? Surely a sensible policy would have been for at-risk students to make sure they had their EpiPens, avoid those areas, and wash their hands before eating. Allergens are not zombie invad invaders with supernatural powers. Touching a contaminated surface cannot cause anaphylaxis, although there's a widespread myth it can. One British specialist spreads peanut butter on allergic kids' arms to prove to anxious parents such exposure is harmless. And transferring allergens via kiss, while hypothetically possible, has never been recorded. Cases, re cases reported as such were later proved wrong. The Oakley story is sadly not an isolated example of our severe reactions to the threat of food allergies. You want isolated? Try this. In July, the Lord Sister Examiner reported that a Tasmanian couple were facing hefty fines because they had kept their son, who has severe allergies and is at risk of anaphylaxis, away from school because they feared he would not receive proper treatment if he did have a reaction, despite consultation with the school and the education department. The child hadn't had any formal schooling for six years. Such extreme responses are not the only harm that may be being caused. A study by the director of the Department of Allergy and Immunology at the Royal Children's Hospital here in Melbourne recently found that kids prescribed EpiPens have a worse quality of life than those without one, irrespective of their allergies or anaphylactic episodes. Fear, uncertainty about using the device, and the burden of having to carry it all the time may be factors, the study suggests. Remember, some of these kids will have EpiPens without really being at risk of anything worse than an allergic reaction. These are the latest details in a picture showing that when it comes to food allergies, our public health conversation is, well, nuts. Exaggerations may be fueling anxieties, in turn fueling prescribing and social behaviours out of proportion to scientific evidence about the risks and medical evidence of what works. The danger in pointing out flaws in the food allergy panic is that it encourages those who want to dismiss the entire phenomenon as fetish or malingering. Food allergies are real, they deserve public attention, education and research. But hyping the risks is potentially distorting scant health resources and creating unnecessary and harmful fear. We need to find a balance between increasing awareness of the real risks without increasing anxiety across the board. That's my, my contention. So keep calm and carry on. Thanks very much, Gina. It's now time to open up uh, the discussion. And to do that, we'll, I'd like to invite all our speakers uh, back onto stage. And we have uh, another participant in the discussion as well, uh, Wendy Norton, who's um, also the mother of two kids who are at risk of anaphylaxis from allergies. So uh, can we, with a big round of applause for everyone, please invite all the speakers back up in the order that you uh, spoke in. So if you want to start along there. Just a reminder, of course, that we're looking for comments and tweets uh, under the hashtag uh, UOMFOI. Is that the right one? Excellent. Um, and we will be joined during uh, the discussion uh, by uh, Ben Kaufman, who's there. Give us a wave, Ben. Ben is from the uh, Melbourne University Debating Society, and he'll be moderating the tweets that you've been putting in. It was initially going to be the president of the Melbourne University Debating Society doing the moderating. Uh, apparently the president is now being held at an undisclosed location. Uh, so there's been a kind of Egyptian style coup uh, in the debating society. But Ben, I'm behind you, don't worry. It's okay, good on you. Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much everyone for um, 
your contributions to a fascinating discussion. I, I wanted to start, um, I think, with Susan um, and the first discussion. You talked about a global uh, epidemic, and uh, I'd be interested to get um, your comments initially and then anyone else who wants to chip in on. How does that global situation break down between countries, and in particular, the developed and non-developed world? What's different yeah. um, across the world? Well, I think we can begin by saying that, that allergies are certainly most prevalent in uh, the uh, more developed, high-income countries around the world. There's, there's very little uh, doubt about that. But we are starting to see uh, transition in the rapidly uh, uh, developing regions, such as China, for example. It's undergoing much more rapid uh, environmental transition than, than we have here. And there are some studies in China where they've looked at food allergy prevalence using the same methods in the same population 10 years apart and have shown a doubling of food allergy there. So it's beginning to happen uh, in developing regions. If we look at NCDs in general, then these are now uh, major killers globally, as I've said, but the greatest burden of NCDs is actually in the low and middle income countries of the world. So regions like China, like India, already have the, the highest rates uh, in terms of highest numbers of obese individuals, of, of diabetics and, and, and so on. So when we look at the total number of asthmatics uh, in the world, there's probably more, or we don't have good data on it, but in, in some of these developing regions. Does anyone else want to um, comment on the global situation? Yeah, I'd like to add to that that we actually um, have found in our Health Nut study, 5,300 children, we looked at some of the effects of um, people who've moved from mm. uh, developing countries to Melbourne. Um, our, our population study is based here in Melbourne, and we found quite quite surprisingly that people who come from Asia to Australia, to Melbourne, um, have a much greater risk of both food allergy and eczema. And so that sort of adds a, a piece of, to the puzzle that there's something about the environment there that's safe that's not safe here. So we tend to put it down to it's something to do with modern lifestyle. And with regards to food allergy, we think it's a combination of um, probably the microbes that we bear, um, you know, our diet, um, but also vitamin D is probably one of the other factors. And we've got some, some early evidence that things like uh, pet ownership, um, number of siblings um, and exposure to uh, things in the environment that might be changing the good bugs that we carry in our body and that's uh, deviating the immune system so that's increasing the risk of food allergy. There's actually um, data also to, to suggest that, that Asian populations may be more genetically predisposed to some of these NCDs, uh, including allergies. Uh, we certainly see that um, uh, our clinics are overrepresented with, with uh, people from Chinese and Oriental backgrounds, for example, uh, in the allergies world. But also when we look at, at obesity, for a given BMI, uh, Asian or Chinese people are much more at risk of the consequences such as heart disease such as diabetes than, than Caucasian. So there's, there's probably a genetic element here as well uh, and su suggesting that when uh, people move into an environment, to, into an environment like uh, Australia, they are at much greater risk. One of the, uh, I think, questions that everyone has to grapple with in this area is exactly how broad the category is when you d describe um, allergic conditions. And I think we've already seen today uh, the perhaps understandable um, tendency to focus on um, severe cases of anaphylaxis and death. Um, again, I'd like to open it up to everyone to comment on exactly well, what is the range of the category and how much, um, how big is the, the really, uh, really dangerous part of it? Well, I guess we could just start by setting the scene and saying even conditions like asthma are not a single condition, yeah. that there are many different um, genes and many different environmental factors that, that, that lead to that single outcome, which is asthma. So it's very difficult to say that, that um, or classify these conditions into a single entity. The same goes for food allergy. It's extremely heterogeneic. Uh, and as has already been pointed out by, by Connie, the most common reactions, say, in food allergy, are the, the trivial, or not the trivial, I should say the milder end of the spectrum, the hives, the swelling, and not necessarily the life-threatening. So it's very difficult to, to really predict in any particular individual exactly what might happen next time they're exposed. So I, I don't think we can give an exact number around that. I'm not sure if other was, others would like to comment. But, but I think we should move away from this feeling that th something's only important if it's life-threatening. Mm. I mean, living with a chronic 
condition mm. is difficult. It means you need compliance for medication, you need money for medication, you need access to health care. So I'd like to move the focus away from, you know, well, they're not dying from it, so it's not important. That's not the case at all. Any chronic condition, be it allergic rhinitis, asthma, eczema, food allergy, these are chronic conditions, they go on and on, need day-to-day -day management. Well, and, and the, the addition to that is that um, you could look at it the other way around with a report card. If there's no death from anaphylaxis, then maybe the system's working. Yeah. Maybe mm. people are administering yes. adrenaline at the correct time and saving you know, lives. But the other thing about adverse reactions to foods is that um, there are different types of uh, food allergies, as uh, Susan um, suggested. There's food allergy that's related to anaphylaxis, and then there's other food allergies and intolerances that are more generically um, less categorised and less, there's less that's known about them. But the one that's related to the risk of anaphylaxis is the only is the immediate type of reaction. So the one that happens within a few minutes of eating the food, the reaction is objective. No one questions that that is actually a true condition. And that 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 rate around the world, well, in developed countries, is thought to be somewhere between two and ten percent, depending on which population you're looking at and at which age. So adults, it may be one or two percent. In young children, it's probably around five to ten percent. So the range varies, but it's not the majority of the community by any means. But it's not a rare condition. It's far more common than inflammatory bowel disease or multiple sclerosis, all those sorts of conditions. So food allergies are relatively, you know, it's not a rare disease, it's not an extremely common one, but it's a concerning one because, you know, unlike things like um, Alzheimer's or cancer or infectious diseases, 30 to 40 years ago, food allergy didn't really exist. And so even if it's increased a little bit, it's increased from zero. And what's interesting is why? I mean, why has suddenly this condition turned up? And when I started in this field, people said, oh, it's just a, mad, a bunch of mad parents. Oh, no, they're just making it up. And when you see the event happening, it is so objective and so clear that, that there's no question you know, a, a, a severe reaction to a food that's IgE-mediated is an objective reaction. Why did it not happen 100 years ago? What is this new phenomenon? And from a research point of view, it's tantalising because if we can find what factor has caused this rise and reverse it, wow, isn't that exciting? And isn't that wonderful for, for kids and parents out there? And Katie touches on another aspect or another mystery here, and that is why we have seen, we're seeing this second wave of the allergy epidemic. I mean, the, the respiratory epidemic, everyone was very familiar with the, the peak of asthma and allergy, uh, respiratory allergies such as hay fever um, occurred in the 1980s and, and has plateaued in many developing or developed uh, countries of the world. But this surge in food allergy is much more recent. It's also almost 20 or 30 years after the peak of the, the respiratory allergy, um, the asthma uh, epidemic. So we really don't yet understand, because this is a new phenomenon, we don't really know uh, why this is happening yet. Uh, and I think that it's still evolving. Uh, certainly uh, in our own experience, again, anecdotal, because we don't, haven't had time to collect the data yet, but in the last few years, we're seeing many more children under six months of age presenting with anaphylaxis. We never saw that before. So something really uh, is changing in our environment and continuing to evolve. Um, I, I mean, I do think the risk of death is, is part of the reason why the public response to um, concerns about being allergic to eating foods has become so alarmed that things get banned all the time. I mean, I do think it's actually really important to tell parents and carers that the, that the risk of dying is really, really small and it's important that you don't end up having, you know, a life um, so constrained by fears of this remote possibility that you don't have a normal, you know, aren't able to have normal interactions. Mm -hmm. You need to be aware that almost all those risks can be managed and that those actually at risk of dying are teenagers who are deliberately not, you know, not wanting to be different from anyone else and not carry their EpiPens. It's, it's, it's not the little kids accidentally getting, you know, their buddies peanut butter sandwich in the playground, but even though that's where all the, all the focus is. But it could, uh, I think as a parent of, I have three children, my eldest has no food allergies whatsoever. He's 13 and he goes off and I don't have a care in the world when he goes out with his friends. My second child is anaphylactic to egg, dairy and tree nuts. And my third child is anaphylactic to egg, dairy, tree nuts, fish, kiwi fruit and sesame. And I live with that fear every day and I find it... James has had anaphylaxis and he had a severe anaphylaxis requiring four doses of adrenaline. And 
it is the most frightening thing to witness your child nearly die in front of you. So, yes, he didn't die. Isn't that good? Does that mean it's not a problem because he didn't die? Does that mean I'm overstating it when I go to the restaurant and I ask and I repeatedly ask and I check and I ring before I go? Because he didn't die, it's not that bad. Is that what you're saying, Gina? Because it really offends me to hear you say that there's only been a handful of deaths, so it doesn't matter. But the problem is I don't know if the death might happen. Um, I've had, James has had hundreds of mild reactions. And you're right, they're only mild. They're hives, um, a bit of itching. They settle with an antihistamine and he's fine. But I have to watch him. I can't just give him the antihistamine and say, right, I'm off to the shop, see you later. I have to watch him because I don't know if that mild reaction is going to progress to anaphylaxis or if it's just going to be a mild reaction. And that's the problem. If I knew, oh, it's just this, I don't care less about hives. It's not, not a big deal. But ha watching your child nearly die is a big deal. And it is something that takes over your whole life and it takes over every single aspect of your life. And I'm not a nutter. I don't ask the school to ban foods. I mean, I know how hard it is to pack a lunchbox that's safe for my kid. I'm not going to expect everyone else to have to go through that as well. All I expect is, you know, the kids wash their hands and the school takes proper measures because, as you say, I need to have a good life. James needs a good life. Harry needs a good life. As a family, we need to be able to go on holidays. And we have to manage that and it takes a lot of planning and a lot of organisation. But to sort of say it's not really a problem because not that many people die, I think, is trivialising it and it's offensive to me. <laughs> and to be, to be fair, I don't think Gina said it's not a problem. Um, the question more, and there was a little bit of uh, perhaps uh, uh, rare, uh, the rare occasion of the media admitting its flaws uh, in what Gina's saying. Well, I'd be interested to know what the panel thinks about whether or not uh, for other purposes, uh, media coverage of these issues does tend to um, sensationalise things. Of course it does. I mean, that's what the media feeds off. Yeah. They, they want the one death and then they go for a feeding yeah. frenzy. What my plea is that there's some um, more balanced education of the populace through the media. There can be huge scope for responsible journalism about allergies, the risks, and the burden that, that families face, instead of just focusing on one terrible death. It should be, how do we compassionately manage a terrible problem that one in 10 families manage these days in Australia? And I have to say, that's the biggest thing. As a family living with it, it's awareness. I mean, research is great. And I said to Katie Allen that she's my hero because she does research into allergies. And, you know, without research, we're not going to get to the, the bottom of what's causing this and prevent it for future generations. But the bottom line is, it's all a bit of a way off before these solutions are found. And in the meantime, we're living with this every day. And it's the awareness that has improved our quality of life. The, the fact that... Um, uh, places like uh, Allergy and, and Anaphylaxis Australia exist. They're a not-for-profit organisation that actually has helped um, allergy sufferers in Australia because they have helped get legislation into schools. Stuff like that is what improves my life. The more aware people are, the more aware restaurants are and they don't look at you blankly when you say you've got a food allergy and they say, all right, you can't eat bread and everyone just assumes it's gluten. Um, so the more aware people are, then the better our life is and the safer my kids are. So awareness is the key for allergy. So to be, to, you know, on the side, the defence of the media, um, though, um, you know, there's always spectrums of the way people beat things up. And, and we are interested when something bad happens. That's just the nature of, of, of you know, the way that we read the media. But to be fair to the media, I think they've, there's been a huge amount of interest in balanced... Um, reporting and in in the last sort of 10 to 15 years the level of complexity of the message that we may be trying to use in the media to help educate the community has really improved quite dramatically and that, that's really very encouraging but to be frank I think when somebody dies from eating a food a, a food that's benign to everybody else it shocks us because we all need to eat and it affects all of us very personally and you know for a family who have to live with that uh, in feeling of being endangered by eating what seems to be something innocuous, that, that's just something extraordinary to all of us. And it remains extraordinary to us as allergists, I think, as well. 
going to open the um, discussion to questions from the floor in just a second. So if you've got questions, there are microphones coming around. Uh, the first question, though, will come from uh, the new President for Life. Congratulations, Ben, of the Melbourne University Debating Society, uh, who's reporting from the Twitter sphere. What have you got for us, Ben? And then we'll go to the, the audience. It's actually a grand dictator, Julie. Sorry, my Sorry. mistake. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got a question from uh, Chase Melbourne, um, which asked, I think it's directed mostly towards uh, Professor Prescott, asking that uh, if al allergies are a reaction to the environment, then how can we moderate this modern environment in order to reduce the prevalence of allergies? I think that um, we need to look in two directions. Firstly, um, we, the, the hot, it's the immune response to the environment. So often people are blaming the environment in terms of the allergen, but we need to look at the environmental changes which are modulating the immune system. And the sorts of things that I mentioned are the candidates. We don't actually know the cause for sure. So we can look at the risk factors which seem to be the things like the cleaner environment, the nutritional patterns that we have, the, um, the pollutants and all of those things. So we need to try and find ways of improving our microbial diversity. So I, I guess that, that that's where um, people have had this huge interest in, in uh, probiotics and the friendly bacteria. There's been a huge interest in prebiotics, which are the, the, the dietary fibre that um, actually promotes immune health of our gut. And there's huge interest in lots of other things like omega-3 fatty acids and all of these things. But it's quite early days and we don't yet have the answers and, and we don't yet understand exactly how we can promote this, uh, overcome, I guess, the enormous pressure of our modern uh, environment. Uh, so I guess that, that's, that is research in progress. Um, and I think we need to understand that the environmental changes are so complex that we may have actually not really captured an accurate picture of, of all of the things that are actually changing between our very traditional environment and our extremely modern environment. It's just so different and it's going to be very hard to, to rebalance all of those things. But I think we need to, to look not just at the risk factors, which is what we've been talking about, but actually the causes of the causes. And those of you who are here this morning may have heard discussions about, about the much wider sort of social, cultural and economic determinants of all of these things. You can't just tell people not to smoke to, to eat this and not to do that. Uh, it's actually our whole social system that's actually promoting this unhealthy living. Complex. Um, we will go to questions now. We might go right into the centre halfway up. Uh, one of the great virtues of asking questions uh, over social media is that you're limited to 140 characters. I'd ask <laughs> everyone to, be, to take that as a model for uh, posing things as a question and keeping them relatively brief, uh, if possible. This question is to Susan. Um, you talked about um, the rates of uh, allergies have increased recently, and Gina mentioned the idea that the rates have increased, or is it the diagnosis has increased? And I asked this from a maybe a unique family. I just thought we were normal. But my father's 75. He suffered from allergies when he was in his 20s. He had food allergies, and they then went away, obviously, through tolerance testing. My sister and I both had allergies, went away, some of it, came back and has caused subsequent problems. I now have a nephew who has suffered anaphylaxis and has nearly died. Are we a unique family or perhaps the research wasn't there in those times? I, I, I agree with you. I think there's a component of both. I think there is evidence that there has been an increase, particularly when we look at things like food allergy, which we just didn't see in, in the same proportions before. Um, but we know that, that uh, rhinitis, that asthma have actually um, been reported and we know there have been da there's data on those for many years. So I think there is, is definitely an increase in awareness, which I think is a good thing. Um, but we've also, um, I think, fairly clear data when we look at some of the longitudinal studies, particularly with asthma, there has been a genuine increase. As I said earlier, that has actually started to plateau uh, in uh, high income, some high income countries. But in developing regions of the world, it is still rising. So I think it both are true and it's very hard to dissect that. Are there actually methods for trying to discern those two things? Uh, increased reporting? Well, Is it possible to measure what the well, when we look right, at, so. I mean, Katie can, can speak to how we can measure food allergy because Katie's done a fabulous study here of, of over 5,000 uh, children in Melbourne where you can objectively look at um, their allergy skin prick test 
uh, rates and then look at, look at food challenges to determine what the actual prevalence of food allergy is. But in terms of looking at change, we actually need to repeat Katie's study again in 10 years. So, so it's going forward, yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately... Yeah. That's the, the yeah. question with yeah. new, new yeah. conditions. If you've never measured it before, yeah. as scientists, yeah. we can't actually say it's on the rise because right. we never measured it before. Yeah. We yeah. can say that the reporting... Well, the hospital admissions for anaphylaxis have been measured over that time and they've definitely risen fivefold mm. in the under five. So we know that there's a rise in anaphylaxis mm. rates. Um, but for food challenge proven food allergy, we have never report, reported it before. But we do know that the uh, self-reported um, rates are much higher than the challenge proven rates. So people think they've got mm. an allergy, then they turn up to the doctor. Um, people often say, well, it's the doctors that are over-diagnosing it. I mean, I think there's reasonable evidence and we have our own uh, internet-based survey where we did in a population representative of the whole of Australia and we found one in three households think they have someone who has a food allergy in their household. Now that's far and above mm. what we think the true rates are. So we do know there is some self-reported over-reporting. We don't, um, and in the past also, you know, when we were first coming to grips with what understanding allergy testing has meant, so 15 to 20 years ago, people were using skin prick tests, which is a little test on the skin, as a proxy for food allergy. So they were saying, if you've got a positive skin prick test, you have a food allergy. We now know only about 50% of people with a positive skin prick test have a food allergy. So 15 to 20 years ago, there was over-reporting even by doctors. But there's now excellent objective criteria standardised around the world. IgE-mediated food allergy is a clear disease, a clear diagnosis and very easily diagnosed now. I'd be interested to um, try and understand better the, if there's over-reporting in the population but also a sense, particularly from you Connie, that there's also a lack of awareness um, of a condition. How do those two factors, which aren't kind of inherently contradictory, how do they interrelate? Well, some of it's semantics. I mean, we use the term food allergy in a very specific medical way, yeah. implying certain mechanisms at play, whereas to general population, food allergy means any adverse reaction to food. Right. And we know that many, many people have adverse reactions to food, people that bloat after a lot of milk, for instance, or bloat after a lot of wheat. These aren't in any way an immunological or a dangerous reaction, but people will say, I've got a food allergy to milk in that way. And I've heard that many times in my practice. So part of it is semantic and understanding the differences in mechanisms of different food related reactions. Okay. Um, the question over here, the gentleman about two thirds of the way back. A question to any of the panel, to what extent do you believe that food preservatives may be a contributing factor? Oh, I'm happy to give that one a go. <laughs> um, actually, um, if you'd like to read our Kids Food Allergy for Dummies book, I, I always say whenever I talk about um, working in the area of, of food allergy research, people say, is it on the rise? And they say, well, we haven't measured it before as a scientist. I like to be able to say it is, but I can't tell you. It's this high, higher than expected. And then they say, why is it on the rise? And then the next question I say is, you tell me why you think it's on the rise. And in fact, food preservatives, I think just from my own straw poll of asking several thousand people now, you know, they would say that's one of the likeliest. We don't have the evidence for or against at the moment. Um, if you'd like my own personal opinion, um, because I've got a training, a training in hepatology, uh, my suspicion is that if there is an effect of preservatives, it's because the food is, is cleaner and that may have an effect, but we haven't got any evidence one way or the other. Our liver is actually pretty good at actually breaking down the chemicals that are part of preservatives. So there's, uh, I often say, some of the general public health measures that may have had an impact on the rise in food allergy and allergic disease in general, maybe a better food supply, a better water supply, cleaner water supply, you know, a, a great use of antibiotics when appropriate, but there may be a downside that our intestines are not stimulated in the same way they used to be by bacteria. Now, I personally don't want to go back to the bad public health days of a dirty water supply and an unclean food chain supply and more helicobacter pylori and infections that we can't treat. So what we're sort of talking about is maybe this is the, the dark side of the good public health measures. So from a personal point of view, I don't think preservatives are likely to be all that important, but there are groups around the world and we are part of a group working with the Bowen Infant Study looking at this question. So we are investigating it. We don't have any data one way or the other. And we are trying to keep our public opinion to a minimum with regards to what is likely to be causing the food allergy ep epidemic or rise in, in prevalence because we'll just confuse the public if we keep coming up with our own hypothesis. So please keep giving us your hypothesis and we'll keep testing them and hopefully we'll feed you back the evidence when it's available. Not by the end of the session though. Um, 
Right over there. Uh, yes, that. Hi, this to all the panel. I was just wondering, how do we increase the responsibility of the food manufacturers and the hospitality departments in, in regards to protecting citizens, um, even to those who don't have se severe reactions? I think even intolerances are something that the public's concerned about because um, it affects their day-to-day -day life. And I'd like to know your opinion on how yeah, we increase that responsibility. Well. Uh, I might start with that one. Um, I, again, I come back to education. Particular, I'm particularly interested in restaurant takeaway food, um, you know, not the labelled food that Katie's addressed, because I think there's a huge level of ignorance. There's sort of lip service to saying we know what a food allergy is, but you only have to scratch the surface to realise that many people are casuals. They blow in, they blow out. They've had no real training. Um, and they'll tell people anything. Oh, no, there's no real cream on that. It's artificial cream or vice versa. So I think it comes back to some standard of education for people to work in, in the food-related industry. The flip side of that is that the mandatory labelling has been a significant improvement and um, there used to be labelling that was confusing, so they used to put words like casein instead of cow's milk. Um, and so there is no excuse for not reading a label. And so I don't know whether we can get the message out to manufacturing, restaurants, you know, people. If you are, have a person who says they've got a food allergy, just read the label. I mean, it's, it's there in plain English, has cow's milk. And there was a recent case, I think, of um, some poor child having a really nasty reaction. And that there is no excuse for ignorance now. I mean, I think everyone knows about food allergies generally, and if someone has a problem, just read the label. I'm sorry, this is what the label says. So I don't know if we can get that message out to people in the catering industry in particular. Um, we'll go you, sir, and then, and then down the front. Yeah. Will I shout? Oh, no, we'll come to you next, madam. I just wonder uh, what message I could take home to uh, my wife and grandchildren tonight. Uh, we're over here from Perth and uh, she spends at least 12 to 14 hours a day absolutely non-stop with a two and a half year old and a five and a half year old. And if we go to a play centre that means six and a half hours climbing up, sliding down, climbing up, sliding down and they're all allergy free. I don't want to trivialise anything. They're not a beast either. That was the last session. Um, <laughs> so I just wonder what I should take home, you know, because they're, they're, they're doing all this and, uh, you know, something must be wrong with them. So if you can assist me in that, I'd, uh, I'd like to take it home. Thank you. It's, uh, I mean, I suppose it's the, the question of how... Um, I mean, obviously everyone here has a very detailed and nuanced understanding of the issues. What's the best way to, um, what sort of messages do we need to send from a public health perspective? Um, and who, who communicates them best? I will I'll probably just leave it at that, sir, so unless, unless anyone doesn't want to comment. Um, in which case, we'll go back to the Twitter sphere or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've, we've recently been awarded by the NHMRC, National Health and Medical Research Council, a Centre of Food Allergy Research, um, which is a centre of research excellence. And in our role, actually, supposedly, we are hoping to do that, is to um, make sure that our research is being trans translated. And so we uh, welcome questions. Uh, we have a website. And um, we also have um, a lot of the experts on this panel have relationships on in sitting on committees for government and um, trying to make sure that the uh, care of food allergy um, sufferers is really front and centre with regards to clinical practice and public policy. So that there, are, there is already um, some um, bodies that are starting to emerge with regards to representing the needs of people with food allergy in the community. Uh, Madam? Regarding the use of antibiotics in food preparation and in medicine, what influence do you believe that has had on allergies? If you actually look at, uh, they say that about 80% of all antibiotics produced are actually used in agriculture. 
um, and that, that's actually for, for livestock to, to um, cattle and so forth. And we're actually part of that food chain. So it's likely that we are ingesting trace amounts, small amounts of antibiotics uh, in the foods that we eat. And there have been some very interesting studies uh, in animals looking at that very low level of antibiotics uh, ingestion uh, in, in early life and shown that it actually increases the risk of uh, overweight, increases the risk of heart disease and all of those sorts of things in the animals. Um, and I guess that what we're saying here is that there is uh, uh, antibiotics are fairly prevalent throughout our food chain and it is likely to be affecting us. The reason it's used in agriculture is that it makes the animals fatter, uh, so it's probably no surprise that it may be influencing us as well. But I don't think that that, that is really you know, the whole story. Uh, it's really just answering your direct question about using antibiotics in, in the food chain. And I don't know if that really addresses what you wanted to, to talk about. But we use a lot of antibiotics um, for other reasons in much higher doses, and I think that we should be limiting that to where they are really needed. And I think that there is obviously a huge pressure for the, in the medical profession to do that now for all of those other reasons about uh, resistant strains and all of those things. I mean, just to follow on from that, our research is now moving into looking at the food chain supply itself. Mm -hmm. um, following on from looking at precautionary labelling, we started to look more formally at some of the labelling that goes on and some of the regulation about um, the way that our animals are fed and, and what impact that might have on health. Because when you look at the regulation and guidelines, they all seem fairly reasonable, but they vary from the EU, for instance. Mm -hmm. And the EU have much stricter guidelines with regards to how growth hormone promotions. Um, uh, the EU will not take meat from Australia uh, for the, in some circumstances unless there's been a period when they haven't had exposure to growth hormone promotions. So there's lots of things that are going on in, the, uh, in, in agriculture and, and um, manufacturing that we really need to make sure that we're partnering with. Um, and when we talk about the health consequences of the veterinary policies that are taking place with our food chain supply, I don't think the partnering is going all the way down to the medical research side of things. So I think vets and doctors and scientists all need to get together to make sure that we're looking after our food chain supply right back to the water supply, the livestock and, and all the way through into pesticides as well. So we think that's a very important next step for us and that's where we're heading at the moment. We've still got a few minutes for questions, but I'll just pause at this moment to just uh, remind everyone that we are conducting an audience poll uh, at the, uh, towards the end of this session. So um, uh, the phone number to text, and we'll bring up the questions in a second, but you can rev up your phones and make sure they're on silent, those sorts of things. But the number is 0429 883 481. Um, if you're uh, part of the webcast, uh, you can vote uh, online, of course, as well, but you need to put a plus six one if you're going to be sending a text message, or you can use the website pollev.com forward slash UOM festival. Uh, so get yourselves ready to send a text message to the number. Uh, we use the uh, Senate op uh, compulsory preferential system, so we'll get results to you within a few months, and Clive Palmer will challenge it no matter what happens. So, uh, but the results do uh, inform the organisers' uh, reports uh, on the Festival of Ideas, and it's a really valuable analytical tool, so please do participate, and we'll uh, give you the opportunity uh, in a moment to uh, participate and answer those questions. Uh, but before we do that, we might go back uh, to um, His Excellency, uh, the head uh, of the Debating Society, to tell us what, uh, to pose a question from the Twitter sphere. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm getting a number of questions in um, on a similar theme of what happens when there is no label. So how can we kind of mitigate and police the risks such as children sharing food in their lunch boxes and other, you know, risks where you, you can't see the label and you can't exactly know what's in the food you're eating? I mean, that's an excellent question. You know, what should we do if we're going to ban precautionary labelling? So, but to get back first to the response about um, lunch boxes in schools, the Australian Society of Clinical Immunology, it's actually the Australasian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy, does not recommend um, banning foods in sc the school environment. That's because who knows whether grandmother's making lunch box one day and doesn't know about the rules in that particular classroom or that particular school. So, the recommendations, which are also in Australia, in Victoria, legislated uh, that there should be a communication plan, is that food sharing 
sharing should be banned, not that food, um, that we should be banned certain types of food. You can't police it. There are children who are allergic to quite rare, rare foods and that's not very fair to the whole school community. So um, children shouldn't be sharing food um, and that's also good from a public health point of view about sharing germs as well. Um, with regards to what should we do instead of precautionary labelling, um, there is actually a new system that the manufacturing industry has tried to introduce in Australia and I'd say Australia is regarded as leading the way. As you could see from my report card, we're pretty good at keeping contamination fairly low. But they've implemented a new system called VITAL, which is a voluntary incidental tracing of allergen labelling, uh, which is a risk assessment tool which manufacturers, if they follow it, should minimise the harm or minimise the risk of contamination. And I actually think that replacing what is currently in progress with a new, this new tool, Vital, uh, at the international level is where we should go. But I think that Vital isn't quite there yet because Vital says these foods have a that may have a trace amount, don't eat those. But at the moment, Vital doesn't tell us what is okay for a consumer, an allergic consumer to eat. So if Vital go one step further and say these foods have been vitalised, give it a green tick or whatever, and we, we think there's, there's, there could be a risk, there may be a risk, but we think the risk is low. And that's the problem with industry is they're too scared to say this is risk-free because nothing, including the glass of water, is risk-free and they hate having to say that. But if we as consumers can, can encourage them to say, you're almost there, go the next step and put it's been vitalised, it's okay for most consumers, take your risk as you please, then I'd be a really happy person. Can I just uh, make a comment about the lunchboxes? I think the allergic child has to have responsibility. I mean, you can't just put this problem onto everyone else. The child himself has to take responsibility. So, you know, my kids know not to take food from anyone else, but that's a hard message. To, it's an easier message to give a kid in grade six than a kid in prep. Um, and all the other little preppy kids so it's so friendly, wanting to offer the food, and, you know, they think that's a nice thing to do. So certainly the school has to encourage the no-sharing food policy, but it's important that the parents teach their allergic child not to accept food. So, you know, that the child has to take some responsibility themselves, but bearing in mind it's hard for a five-year-old to be perfect all the time. So the banning, the sharing is, is a really important step to keep the kids safe at school. I'm keen to get your thoughts on that, Gina, as well. Just before I do, though, can we bring up the questions for voting just so that we've got those um, available? Um, I'll read out the questions. Um, so that you can, you text a code to the number um, and the, f uh, the first proposition is we must adopt a more integrated approach to preventing disease from early life and the multi-system benefits of improving immune health will reduce a wide range of inflammatory NCDs across a lifespan. Not quite tweetable, but, uh, but you can vote for it by, <laughs> uh, by texting um, 407, 49078. Uh, the second proposition, we all need to eat uh, so we should all care about food safety and food labelling. The number there is 490080. Uh, third proposition, we must improve community awareness of food allergies with more resources dedicated to education, food labelling and medical management. Text 49092. And finally, we need to find a, a balance between encouraging awareness of the real risks of food allergies without increasing anxiety across the board. Five, 49156. Um, Gina, did you have any thoughts on the lunchbox issue or, or anything? anything else? Well, yes, I, I, I suppose um, most of the questions and most of the interest is around, of course, the medical research and stuff, but the actual what happens in the community, which was more the kind of thing that I'm interested in, often complicated health messages, um, partly through media sensationalisation, but also partly because that's how our brains work, focus on dangers and think, I will manage them by excluding any risks I can. And that's the same with all kinds of public liability problems throughout the community. But what we <coughs> need to do is to be, make sure that those responses are rational all the time. So things like banning sharing is, is as various people have already argued, are such a simple um, and, and um, it, it leaves the responsibility where it needs to be, where, it's, where the risks can be managed best. Um, and I suppose the kinds of things I'm arguing for are that we need to include those kinds of problems in looking at the public health policies around these kinds of things, how they're really going to play in the community. Not, so we, we need to look for the evidence, 
but we also need to look for who is actually going to be listening to these messages, because often the people who you most want to hear them aren't going to be listening at all. We've got time for, uh, I think, one more question, um, and to you, Madam, there in the fourth row. Hi. Um, as someone who's recently moved to Australia who has allergies, um, I'm just kind of curious what politically is is done because I'm finding Australia is actually a rather hostile environment compared to what I'm used to in terms of exposures in the environment and there's there doesn't seem to be a lot of regulation. So I'm curious what the level of political awareness is about this issue. Well, in the state of Victoria, actually, the level of political awareness is very high. In fact, we've got the first legislation in the world with regards to safety for food allergy in schools. Um, and I think Canada was second. So we're pretty aggressive about um, government and policy awareness here in the state of Victoria. And I understand WA and New South Wales have some similar legislation. I think WA now has legislation regarding school safety. Maybe at the adult level, though, the awareness is much lower. So in, in kids, I think there's reasonable awareness, but I think the adult um, world is a little bit behind in Australia. Is that what you're asking about, about food allergen labelling? Yeah, like or labelling yeah. and regulations yeah. around... For me, for example, where you can smoke. Yes. You smoke everywhere here. It's very strange. Uh, I think actually that's not the case. I think Australia is actually quite progressive in its smoking legislation. So I, I beg to differ on that point. <laughs> and we've sort of recently introduced plain packaging and all of those things. And um, so I, I think that then in terms of legislation around smoking, which uh, is a very important aspect of, of risk for asthma, for example, and other things, that we are actually progressing and we do have strong legislation. Um, I think that you've raised another issue, though. Obviously, it's easier to ban smoking, but it's much harder to ban food. Uh, and, and particularly, we're not just talking about allergens when we talk about the risk of immune disease, we need to look at the level of fat, the level of salt, the level of sugar, all of these things in our food. Uh, and that is a major issue that I think that globally we need to be thinking about. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, that is all we have time for. Um, there are buses to the uh, convention centre. I think the next one's at is it 5 or 5? In, in 15 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. So if you want to go to the next venue. But before we do that, can we please thank all our speakers uh, and thank you for your participation in the session today. Thanks very much.